Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in Canterbury. Tonight, I've got a special treat for you. I'm gonna show you something I've been working on for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> on and off. There's a new one. Yeah, and then we're going to get into the whole topic of making a round frame of any size and using a segmented technique. Now this is actually gonna be a two-parter, but here I wanna start off with showing you my 10-year project. I'm pretty sure it's 10. Check out these beautiful aged pieces of cherry. These are segmented round frames. Now they are not finished. All that I did to that point was glue them up. And I wasn't totally happy with the way the joints came together and I know now what happened. Um, they actually are pretty tight. I don't know what I was thinking. So in our upstairs bathroom, we have like a, you know, the side-by-side -side sinks. We had these round mirrors, which in our haste, they're already hanging on the wall, but they were actually sized for these frames. So they're up on the wall with those little metal brackets. I think it was around the Harry Potter days, like when my, our, our younger son, I went down to um, the, the Harry Potter world in Universal Studios when it first opened. And I, it was prior to that, but we had been, you know, you seeing all that, those images and stuff. And it was the spectacles. It was the glasses. And I got to thinking, wouldn't it be cool, right, if your mirrors over the sinks were actually just like the spectacles? So you have the frame and the glass in there. And then you have like a removable, okay, so don't worry about this, a little bridge for the nose, right, between the two, right? So imagine like this, above the vanity, and you got the little bridge piece curving here, and then you have these little stubs that you put on here. You know, you're, you feel like someone's looking back at you, or you're gonna make a spectacle of yourself. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. All that no, but that. it's not like these giant, giant eyeballs looking back at you so we're gonna work tonight on the technique for making these round frames we want to make a little smaller study example um, but one that could be quite useful so you can use this not just for mirrors but obviously for photographs maybe a special photograph and i looked for like mats that were already cut round but there aren't a lot however they do sell plexiglass of like for mounting photos behind and uh, quite a lot of different sizes. You know, you can get four, six, eight, 10, 12 inch circles and you can get them in packs of 10 and they're quite reasonable. Same goes with mirrors because a lot of these mirrors are sold as centerpiece uh, platforms for, you know, you've seen them in weddings, you know, you have the, the mirror in the center of the table with the flowers or whatever on top and it just embellishes it in a very nice way so anyway let's map out our new round segmented frame and we will get started so i've got a piece of mdf here like i like to use a lot of times and i just put a piece of paper on the top because we're going to map it out we got to think about the joints the size of the pieces and everything so to draw the circle out is extremely helpful because it helps you to know what size pieces you need, width, length, because you're dealing with circles. So here's, look at how old this paper is. I was playing around with different angles. So on some six sections of this paper, I have it laid out for eight pieces, and others I have six. And I actually ended up going with only six pieces for that frame. So, Let's, let's map it out. We'll, we'll map this one out for eight, and we'll talk about the angles here in a second, but um, I kind of made a general center point here. It doesn't m matter, really, for the center here, but I'm going to use this little spot, and I'll just get a nice square on here using this nice woodpeckers square. I do like this. I mean, it's they're fine. I know they're not inexpensive, but this little lip thing is genius because you can sit it up there and it doesn't fall for change. And there we go. We've got that little crosshairs now. I'm going to use my 45 
here for my drafting triangle here and just go right to the center. So I'm going to draw all four, well, eight pieces of the pie so we can totally envision this thing. Oops, kept it where I had it. And so here's the thing, you know, you can decide based on the material you have, but you can also decide after you lay it out. But I'm going to start with the eight. So let's make a circle. I'm going to say we're going to use a 10 inch round glass or plexiglass if we're going to put photos in there or for the mirror we'd use the 10 and we did put links to the some of these that are available like on amazon links but you can find them other places i'm sure all right so given that it's going to be a 10 inch diameter we're going to start by drawing the glass okay so i'm going to take a uh, a rule and i'll just set my compass here to five. Let's bring it right into the, that's right, right? Yeah. It's gonna go right there. I'm starting on the four, so there we go. And let's make a little point right in here. That's good. And here's our glass. Okay, so now usually the lip or rabbit that it's going to sit behind on the mirror is about a quarter inch lip in there. So you have room, and then you can put something behind it to tack it. So let's figure on a quarter inch. We also need to have a little slack for the mirror itself. So we're going to just go, we're going to come inside that glass line 316 so we're going to have an overlap of 316 on the glass but then we'll have a 16th me on it so we'll have that amount of play so overall we're going to have an eighth inch larger diameter than the glass okay because we're going to 16th on this side and so these are the other two points we want to make circles on so let's just set into our center point and this first one here is going to be the inside radius of our segmented round frame. Here we go. So you could do this for any size glass and you're just going to lay it out like this. Now I'm going to mark the, the rabbit depth here. I don't have to do that right now, but I will so we can all understand what we're doing here. So that's a full quarter, just adding a quarter to the inside radius, right about there. So that gives a little bit of room for that glass to fit in, the glass or the mirror, okay? Now, um, we haven't decided, but I did decide I was going to go with a 12 inch total radius, uh, I'm sorry, diameter on this piece. So we're going to just go, I'll set this out to six inches so we can get it out to the whole, I'll start on the five here. We're just going to draw, this is our outer perimeter. So this is going to be a nice little, about a, it's going to be about an inch and a quarter, maybe a little less, right? So yeah, it's going to end up about an inch and quarter, inch and three sixteenths uh, thick this way. But we'll go. Let's go with three quarter inch thick material to make it. And I'm thinking it'll be set in the back, and we'll, this could just be a full kind of radius with a nice round over all around if we'd like. Um, I think that might look nice. All right, so here we go. We've got all our cuts now. If we want to figure out how long we're going to make one of these pieces we like we want to cut these segments up 
and we want to get them out of straight stock for this method, okay? Um, now, we're going to use eight pieces, so let's get into our geometry. Let's say we only had four pieces, and we got a circle out of that, we'd start basically with a square. So the four angles, the corners, are all 90 degrees. So you have four times 90 is 360. So that's basically the concept for those of you who aren't familiar with the geometry of circles like that. But the angles always add up to 360 degrees, no matter how many joints you have, okay? So if we're going to have eight pieces, we're just going to cut in half, and so instead of four, we're going to have all of the angles are going to be 45 degrees. So this is a 45 degree angle here. But in order to make a 45 degree angle with two pieces meeting, each piece is 22 and a half degree joint. So if we go back to our square, all the corners are 90, so every piece has to be, the miter is actually half of corner so it's 45 degrees here we've got eight pieces so the actual angle of it is 45 but to get that that miter we have to cut them at 22 and a half so same like if we decided on the six piece like that one over there it would be 60 degrees six into 360 60 degrees and then each miter would have to be half of that 30 to make the 60. I just made this on the, um, just on the chop saw, actually on my Felda. So this is dead on. This is a 67 and a half degree angle or 22 degrees taken away from 90. We need a big enough piece. We don't want to try to have the edge of it here, right here. We're going to come in about an eighth of an inch. So right about there. So let's just come in and we'll draw this little angle. Okay, that's going to be the inside of my straight piece. And then on the outside, I know I, I have some pieces that are right about inch and three quarters. Yeah, so there we go. We've got inch and three, that's an inch and three quarters. Whoops, let me come up here a little. And there we go. All right, so see, I'm in a little outside of my circle. Um, I actually gave a little too much in here. I could push this out and I'd actually have a little more. So anyway, that is the length of one of our segments in order to get the circle out inside of that. So let's measure across here and see what we ended up with. Just a little under. I'm going to go a full five and a sixteenth. That'll just push it out a little bit more. So on the long points, so we'll say five, one sixteenth inch. And these angles, if you're thinking of this, this is like a 90 here. So this is actually 22 and a half. If this, if this were a 90, and, 90 degree piece, 22 and a half and 67 and a half. So same down here, okay? So now you have to create something that'll give you that nice number. Um, so at a chop saw, protractor, you've got to really know that you've got a trustworthy template to get your angles on. Now, um, I'm going to use some material here. I took a uh, plank, as you may have seen me do be before, and usually when you have a plank, it's plain sawn, or you have the grain or those those growth rings are kind of wider, wider part. They're not, they're about a half to three quarter eighths of an inch apart. So you're getting more to that flat sawn section. So if you ripped that piece up and you've laid it on side, you're gonna have more like quarter sawn material. So if we look at the end grain there, it's technically, this is called rift, because it's at an angle of about 30, 35 degrees there. What that's gonna give us is this nice linear grain on top. So we'll go for that. And um, we'll try to keep that grain somewhat connected around the circle, okay? It'll be, it won't be perfect, but it'll be fairly close. So we're gonna have eight pieces and I already kind of laid out these light little chalk marks at five and a half inches wide, okay? So that's gonna give us some extra. 
So I'm going to number these actually. We'll go one, two, so we can, when we assemble them, we'll keep them together, okay? So we, we keep, we won't mix up, so we know the grain will be more aligned here. Six, seven, and eight, okay? And that chalk mark there is on the inside. We'll remember that. So let's head to the bandsaw. We're gonna just chop these up real quick. I got the fence set to right about five and a half, a little less. Beautiful. All right, so you're probably saying, hey, Tom, what kind of wood is that? That's pretty cool, that brown stuff. I've never seen anything like that. I smelled it because it's actually been cooked like at a very, very high temperature called thermally modified wood. It's baked, I think I've, I've read, I'm remembering right, like four to 500 degrees. It's basically kiln dried, but then baked way beyond the point so that all of kind of like the sugars or um, the lignum in there crystallizes and it just, it makes it a more stable product, but it actually browns it all the way through. This wood, believe it or not, is ash, which is as white. It's a very white, light colored, creamy colored wood. But look, it's brown all the way through. And this was from an eight quarter plank. What's really sweet about it is if you had planned to make something and stain it brown and you use this stuff, there's no staining required. You can go <laughs> right to your shellac or oil varnish or whatever you are going with. Now we've got to cut these into our segments. And remember from our measurements, we decided it was five and one sixteenth point to point to ship that out. We're gonna do this on the crosscut table, uh, the crosscut sled on the table saw, because that's where I find you get the most accuracy. And I wanna to try to just get it right off the saw blade, not have to shoot these joints with a plane or anything like that. And you can do that if you have a good sharp saw and you have a nice firm way of holding the material that won't slip and it's accurate. So part of the accuracy is having a nice kind of wedge that holds your accurate angle. So here's the, those same angles are recreated. So this is 22 and a half degrees here and we come over to our 90 degree corner and then it's 67 and a half up here. So the triangle is 180. Uh, so we're going to put this against the fence on the crosscut sled and our pieces, like this is gonna be the inside edge, so we want it to come this way. Our pieces are gonna rest on here, so we'll get our 22 degree angle here, okay, or our 67 and a half. Uh, so that's gonna come in from this point and then we'll flip it around and we'll put a stop in and then we'll get our other end. All right, so let's head over to the table saw and knock these out. All right, so here we go. We've got our setup here. I've got all my numbers facing me so I don't mess that up. And I'm gonna hold them here. And I've got my wedge that I just showed you right on here. So I'm gonna bring it in and keep the number facing me. That's the inside of my, my segmented disc. And I tack this right to the table with a brad nailer here a 22 gauge, 1850 GB. People always ask. The Grex is the one I have, but there's a lots of guns out there, but these are great. Uh, so this is gonna hold on that angle. And because you're dealing with small pieces, whenever I'm dealing with like, little pieces like this, it, it makes sense to just take a few minutes and put a hold down on there. And now it's not gonna slide around and you can just 
relax and we'll push it through nice and evenly. And that's part of the accuracy of this set situation is that you're going to get a much nicer cut. And so first I'm gonna start, cut the angle on one end of all these. So here we go. So then I would take my rule and I'd come over my 5 and 1 16th, make a mark, and then that becomes the piece I'd set in here, and then i bring in my stop. So I've got a stop here, already cut that angle on it, and it's just going to sit right against my piece. I had it on earlier, so there's already a couple little bumps there that have it so it'll go in the right place. but. Um, you want to bring that stop right up. Now notice I did relieve the bottom edge there, so I can't get any dust in there that'll keep it from hitting fully on the stop. Because the key to all these joints ending up right is having your angle correct first to start with, but then all the pieces being cut exactly the same length. This stop is critical to achieving that. So here, we're going to just nail these in again. Now we've got a good stop in place. We're gonna just bring it up. And so we're gonna flip these. So by flipping, every joint is going to be the combination of one end that was cut vertically and the other end that was cut face down. So if there is any kind of error in my blade angle, that should cancel out. And that's one of the aspects that does give you a nice joint. Now you are risking some tear out down on the table on one side, but I'm gonna be cleaning these up significantly, so I'm not worried about it. And I'm getting very little anyway with this. All right, so here we go. We're gonna run these through and then we'll be ready for joinery. We have all our pieces now cut to length and with our proper angle, so let's head back to the bench. Now, um, I'm gonna show you a method using my a domino. It's, a, uh, it's like a biscuiter, but it actually makes a slot 
for a little tenon, a floating tenon. Actually, they're all different sizes, but I'm using the smallest of their tenons for this one because I don't need a lot of strength. And they really are great because they, they hold alignment for you as well. Now, obviously, this, this tool isn't cheap and not for everyone, but it's like a $1,000 tool here, this domino cutter. Um, so next time I'm going to show you a method that is not very expensive at all to do this kind of thing. So, but tonight I wanted to show you this method because some of you have this and it's kind of fun and to see how efficient and accurate you can be with a tool like this. So I am setting up, I've got a, just a plain board and I put a straight edge on the board here and I've got this hole down for a reason you'll see in a second. But I'm going to clamp this to the bench and make myself a little joinery cutting station, which goes pretty quickly. So I want to put a little slot in each one of these with this little tenon. And this is where it helps to have the drawing as well because you want to locate this in the proper spot. This is our piece right here. We want this little joint to be somewhere. If we put our biscuit in place here, right there, about the middle of this, I think I measured it earlier, it's going to be about three quarters of an inch. So I want it justified to the inside because I'm going to be, this is the actual width when it's finalized. So it's actually only three quarters from this inside heel point. So that's critical. If you just stuck that in the middle, you'd risk it coming through or showing through the outer surface. So I lay that out and I got it marked. I came up about three quarters of an inch on my set piece to mark this out, but it was just using the drawing. I just made a mark and I knew that was the one. And so I want that to be equal on each end so that when these come together, the points will all line up pretty closely, okay? Here's, here's one of the tricks you can use with your domino. So I want to set this up, and I thought if I could just set this at the proper distance away from the fence, let's just make an arbitrary line here. I think it was right about three quarters. This space was an inch and five sixteenths. So that's the piece that I cut, and that's going to fit right in there. And let's see, I've got he had that nailed in. So there, I'm going to hold this in. I'm going to nail this in. Okay, now that piece, I cut it a little shorter than my piece. So I just center this. I'm going to use this toggle clamp again. That's going to hold it nice and firm, the right distance away. And now I can come over here with the Festool and just hit it on each end. I'll do a couple of these and then I'll show you um, some I already did so we don't have to do them all. very simple once it's set up to get all your joinery cut and then if I put one of these little biscuits in there look how that point matches up beautifully and our miter is just right I would go through them all get them all set up like that and then I'd be ready to prepare for gluing up so let's set this aside I'm gonna just gonna go a little further with this I want to show you now imagine that all these were the ends were done on them. Now it's time to assemble them into our circle. Now, this is kind of like a little overkill in a sense, like because the grain is so linear. But remember, piece number one 
was like almost four feet away from piece number eight. So if the grain changes quite a bit, and it, I can see it change, if it changes quite a bit from one to eight, you're going to see that joint not match as well, right? So what we're gonna do is when we start to lay these out, I would start with one here, and then, of course, I'll go with two next to it. So two will look good right there. And then rather than go right around three, four, five, six, this is kind of a trick we use from uh, veneering too. Like rather than going around and then having eight right next to one, we're gonna move three over here. So now three's next to one here, but I'm only missing one piece. So the grain match is pretty close there. And then I'll go four back over this way, next to two, five goes back to three, six goes over by four, seven, five, and then eight is next to seven and six. So there's nothing too far away. So your harmonious kind of grain, whatever grain you have, will more than likely be better. But this linear grain is very forgiving because of all the lines in it, you know, if you have, but if you had really bland like plain sawn, that would work pretty well, pretty well too. So that's how I'm gonna arrange these. Now, if I pull this together, which I did on, the, on another one, I already pulled it together and I took my template, if all these were points were here and I laid it on top, I had it temporarily in my little strap clamp to hold it up. And then I was able to lay this on and make my circle on the inside. So then once you make your circle, I'm going to see, I'm going to use this strap clamp. I haven't used this a lot, but uh, it's pretty cool. It's, it's really useful because of these little movable jaws. So these little pieces sit on the, every joint. So it sits there. If you can see what's happening on this one. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Whoops, <laughs> that's not very good. So once all the joints are in there, once, see once all the dominoes are in there, it doesn't slide around. And you can actually, I'll show you that in a second. You can actually press these all together and you have a uniform piece. That's what's nice about having that. Glue up would be a nightmare with these pieces if you didn't have any kind of stabilizing tenon across that joint. You go to put pressure, they're going to all want to slip and just be, make a mess. So that having that method of a domino or some type of dowel set up or something, um, even if you only had one dowel, that would work if you had a good doweling jig set up where you registered the same in from the point, the same dimension and went in 90 degrees to that surface on every one. If you did that, you get a good result because when you clamp it up, you could make sure everything's flat and nothing's twisted when you had did your clamping. When I had it clamped up, I sawed around the inside and I trimmed off that curvature so that I, once it's glued up, I won't have to take like a jigsaw in there. Once it's glued up, I can trace the outside easily and just bandsaw right around that curve pretty quickly and then trim it up on the, on the router to smooth it much faster. But the inside, I would have to use something like a jigsaw or a scroll saw or something like that. So by pre-sawing, I've saved myself some time. I'm gonna set these aside and let's just pull this one together. So here's another set that I've already I got all the dominoes in one side and I cut the little radius roughly to the line on the inside. And now we can go ahead and assemble this one. So I went one, two, I put that little two to see that. And then so three would be over here, four would be over here. Then over here with five, here with six, here with seven. So with this type of thing, if I'm gluing this up, I don't think I'm going to glue it up. I would just get all the glue on. I'm not going to do it tonight because it would just take too long. But 
I'd get a little glue. You'd have to be organized and have everything apart and facing up like this. Get a little in each slot. Go right on around and lay them down. And you'd have to have this well rehearsed. Let me get my uh, MDF. Okay, that's better. Once this piece is all together, I think rather than try to glue the whole thing around and, and have it all come together, sometimes it's better to just glue this half, get the glue in there, and then now these, these are at a right angle to each other. So you can just sort of coax these two in last. Um, you still haven't done any clamping yet, but there you are. And then with all that glue in there, we'd be having a little bit of a mess there, but you can see now this clamp comes over and these little guys go a position that each are at a joint like this. So you, you do a dry run with it so you, you get the right amount out there and it doesn't take as long to set up. This is not something I use a lot because I, uh, I don't do this kind of thing. Ton. Or when I do, uh, it's often not this many joints, and I'll just use a, my own block where I'll temporarily tack something and use actual clamps. But this, this method works pretty sweet. See, now they're all there. You want to center them roughly. And then you just turn this little crank, and those joints are coming up. If you need to adjust any, now that you got them snugged, make sure all the feet are right. There we go. And now I'm going to get good kind of inward pressure on every one of those and we get a pretty cool result. So we'd have the glue in there, have that all snugged up. I could center this after, but you can see how everything's pulled up really great. Once this is dry, I'll then come in with my template and set it on here. And so I've got a nice little amount of waste. I'd center it to the point where I had a little overhang all in here. And I'm going to tack it to the piece, probably from the underside. Uh, but before I do that, I'll, I'll make a line and I'll cut the circle, the outer side. This is after we're glued up. And so I'm ready for this flush cutting. And then I would take it to the router table and flush cut it. We'll probably pick that up next time. Now, someone asked, how did I make this template? That's a great question. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but I'll show you the jig I used. I've shown this before. I think we probably have a Shop Night Live where we did a round tabletop. So we have a circle cutting router jig in one of the Shop Night Lives that you'll connect. So it's super easy. It's just attaching your router to a piece of MDF like this. This is about six inches wide. And then I drill a larger hole for the bit to come through. So if I push, plunge that bit, you can see how the bit is right resting on the inside edge of that hole. So I'm just going to measure over, like let's say I want that outer diameter to be 12 inches apart. So I just want to measure from that edge to the center, the pivot point, I want to be six inches from that point to that bit and that's what that is to so see we're six inches to that hole and then the inside though is going to cut I'm going to be pivoting off of this point and now I want to go to this edge so that's my radius I forget exactly what it was I think it was nine and five eighths diameter so I had to be like uh, 3 16 shy of, of 5 to that point. So you can see the center of that hole is 3 16 shy of 5 to that edge. So that pivots around. Now, I just use a quarter inch drill bit to drill these holes on the drill press. And here's the bit. So you use the bit to drill the holes, but then you use the, the shank of it as your pivot point. Okay, so I had a bigger piece here. I did this on a previous demo. I was doing a, for one of the tabletop videos we did. 
but I just had needed a piece of quarter inch plywood. So I just tacked the whole thing to the table, used this center hole, the same center hole, brought the jig over and I'll extend the bit so it finds the hole. And then that's my pivot point. I plunge and make my cut and that's going to give me my outer radius. So this piece was sitting right there and that trimmed this. Then I just moved to this one and all this information I got off the drawing as well. And I went right to the center and then right on around and I cut that inner radius. So you could do this and get yourself any kind of frame, any kind of nice radius. So this is going to be my template for the flush cutting radius. So now I've got nice smooth surface to go with. I thought I might glue that up, but I think it would have been just too much to try to do that all tonight. But it would essentially look just like this, but we would have had glue squirted it all around. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I wish we could have got all the way down. I would have shown you a finished one, but that's for next time. We're going to pick this up and I'm going to show you another method next time on the table saw for making actually the method I used to make my giant spectacle of myself. You can use this with all kinds of material. Look how heavy duty this one is. So this one, I did use those itsy bits for the joint. And that's what I'm going to show you next time. We'll do something a little different um, and we'll make our joints with a less expensive method. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Remember, if you enjoy this content, please subscribe, share, and like, and all that good stuff. And also, if you want to go a little further or deeper with us, you can head on over to epicwoodworking.com and check out the website, all the offerings there. We've got lots of courses and things there. Thanks again for being part of our time here. We couldn't do it without you. And on behalf of the camera lady and myself, we'll look forward to seeing you next time.